Okay. So the first question that I got um, was asking about if the price of a good is less than the average variable cost of the good um, in the long run, can the firm make money? So remember the kind of most important piece in the long run is that the fixed costs become variable costs. So if the price of the good is less than the average variable cost in the long run, the firm should shut down. And this is even more true because as I mentioned, the firm's fixed costs become variable. And so because of this, even in the short run, if the firm uh, or if the price of the good is less than the variable cost, the firm should shut down. So basically, if the price of the good is less than the average variable cost in the long run, the firm should just shut down. The firm should not continue to produce. And this is even more true because in the long run, the firm's fixed costs become variable. And so the reason for that is basically the firm can do things like get out of lease contracts, get out of employment contracts, get out of different uh, types of long-term commitments that they could not get out of in the short run. So because of that, even more so in the long run, if the price of the good is less than the average variable cost, the firm should shut down because they're going to be making losses during that time period. Okay. So then the next question I got was asking about uh, when a price of a good increases, why do producers produce more of the good? Um, and specifically they're asking if the price increases, wouldn't that also mean there are fewer buyers? So it's a really good question. And I think that's kind of thinking about the longer term implications of kind of the firm's cost structure in the short run versus the long run. Okay, so why don't we look at kind of an example of that and what that kind of process is gonna look like. So we have here, let me zoom out a little bit. So we have here this standard demand and supply graph. And so we have demand is downward sloping, supply is upward sloping. We have a normal equilibrium here where the equilibrium price and the equilibrium quantity. So what this upward sloping supply means is that as the price increases, producers are going to want to sell more and more of a good. And so that does mean that there are likely going to be fewer buyers, but remember what happens if we, if the price gets to this point, let's say. So remember that we have this difference right here. And that difference is effectively a surplus. So if, there was ever a situation where the producer got into a situation where the supply was greater than the demand, which if the price increases above the equilibrium is what's gonna happen, then what would happen is basically the, there would be too much of the good produced. So that would decrease the price of the good or drive the price of the good down. So then we would get into a situation where it slowly decreases and slowly decreases and it would move back to the equilibrium. So even if the price of the good is greater than the equilibrium, that can, this can exist in the short term. Surpluses can exist in the short term. But remember, unless it's a price floor or a price ceiling, it's always going to move back down to the equilibrium price because this is uh, not a stable outcome. There cannot be greater surplus 
than or greater supply than there is demand. That just cannot happen in the market. Okay. So the next question was asking um, about the profit maximizing rule. And so I think just kind of a really good uh, thing to remember is this right here. So the marginal revenue is equal to the marginal cost at the profit maximizing quantity. This is just a really important rule to remember because it is very easy to see where firms should produce. So in this case, in this graph, we can see very clearly that this Q1 is the point where the firm should produce. That's where the marginal cost curve intersects with the marginal revenue curve. And we remember for perfectly competitive firms that the price is the same as the marginal revenue curve. Um, for different types of structures, this is not true, but for perfectly competitive firms, this is true. So I think it's a good idea if we think about what it means to be at QA or QB. So let's think about QA first. So the price is greater than marginal cost. So what does that mean? So that means that if the firm produces another unit of the good, the firm is earning additional money. So the cost is not equal to the revenue. So the firm is earning additional profits here. So they're earning additional profits until they hit this point. And then they're earning no more profits on each additional good produced. So that's why for the firm, if they're at QA, they should increase production to Q1 because each good produced from QA to Q1, they're earning a profit on each one of those goods produced. Okay, so now let's think about QB. So QB in this case, means that the marginal cost is greater than the marginal revenue. So what does that mean then? So that means that in this case, the firm is basically every good produced that's greater than Q1 up to QB, the firm is losing money. So if the firm moves from here to here, the firm is losing this difference right here. So this is a loss because every additional good produced from Q1 to QB, the cost of producing that good is greater than the revenue that the company earns for selling a good. So that's why if the firm is at QB, the firm actually needs to go back to Q1 because at Q1, that's where marginal cost and marginal revenue are equal. So kind of a good, good way to think about profit maximization is just to think about this and try to remember that when the firm is not at marginal cost equals marginal revenue, they're either, they either, either could earn more money by producing more goods or they could earn, uh, could decrease their losses by moving back. So basically they're either moving back or moving up to get to this point. Another good way to think about it, and let me zoom in a little bit, is this graph right here. So this is kind of a simple version um, of the graph we tend to think about, but I think it kind of nicely conveys the importance of uh, kind of what profit looks like. So in this case right here, we have the average revenue, marginal revenue, and price. So remember those three are all gonna be equal for the perfectly competitive firm. And we have in this case, the marginal cost curve and the average cost. So if we say this point right here, where the marginal revenue intersects the marginal cost, that is the quantity that we're going to produce. And so this, 
difference right here between this and this, between the marginal revenue and the average cost, that is gonna be profit for the firm. So all of this is profit for the firm because that is the amount of quantity produced that is greater than the revenue. So we see that the average cost curve here is this point and revenue is this point. So every single good produced here, this is the profit to the firm. Okay. So then the next question was asking about what happens to the market and the firm in the long run if there's profits. Okay, so really important that this is a perfectly competitive market. So in a perfectly competitive market, if there are profits in the long run, additional firms will enter the market and produce goods. So what this does is this causes profits to slowly decrease until the market no longer has profits. And from the one slide in the lecture notes, we can see here that this is what happens. So basically as the, as there are profits, so this single firm is earning profits, in the market what happens is you first have demand move from D1 to D2. So you move from A to B. So what that means then is that price moves from one to two. So price increases, quantity increases. But because the firm is making profits, other firms are going to enter the market. And when other firms enter the market, what happens is supply, shit, supply increases. Because remember, if there are new firms entering the market, they're going to produce more of the good. So when other firms enter the market and produce more of the good, you move from S1 to S2 or the original supply curve to the new supply curve. So D1, D2, S1, S2. So now you're at C. And so note that point C actually is getting us to this long run supply where the price is basically constant for all firms. And so because of that, that means there are no longer profits in the market. So that's a really important piece here, is that there can be profits in the short run, but in the long run, in a perfectly competitive market, there cannot be profits because demand increases, and then supply increases, which causes price to decrease back to the original price and profits to be competed away. <clears throat> okay. And then the next question was kind of similar to that in asking, how do you find the short and long run equilibrium? So I think it's important to just recognize the equilibrium in the short run is constantly changing. And the reason for that is because of this. So because you have maybe firms making profits, the price is going to constantly change and move up, up and down. And so there's always going to be kind of a short run disequilibrium or the price is not going to be constant. But as the firm's, but as in the long run, the firm's average variable costs are going to be less than or equal to the price they receive for their goods. So in the long run, in a perfectly competitive market, profits will be competed away and reduced to zero. And so this will occur basically by new firms entering or exiting the market until profits are zero and every firm in the market um, has zero profits. So until every firm in the market has zero profits, new firms will enter. And then once, pro once profits have been reduced to zero, that will be kind of a new equilibrium that takes place where you get into this long run supply.
<laughs> okay. So then the next question was asking about um, the long run market supply curve. And I think kind of uh, an important piece to think about when you're thinking about long run market supply curve is that it's horizontal where the price is equal to the minimum average total cost. And so that basically means just what we were talking about here. So this was the minimum average total cost. Price is equal to that over the long run because basically there are zero profits in the long run. And so there's a key caveat to that though. And the key caveat is that the long run market supply curve is horizontal if all firms have identical costs and costs do not change as other firms enter or exit the market. So that's really, really important that all firms have the same costs and costs do not change as other firms enter or exit the market. And so if either one of these assumptions is not true, then the long run supply curve slopes upward. So both of those assumptions have to be met for the long run supply curve to be horizontal like this. If that's not the case, then the long run supply curve is not going to be a horizontal line. It's not gonna look like that. And so just to kind of walk through this example, what you see here is this is one firm and this is the market. So for this one firm, we have the marginal cost intersecting at the long run average total cost. And this intersection point is going to give us the long run supply curve because both of these conditions have been met. All firms have identical costs and costs do not change as other firms enter or exit the market. And we can also see that same process play out in this instance. So in this instance, we see that there's the short run where we have kind of these firms earning temporary profits and we have the market reacting in the short run. But then in the long run, we see that their supply is horizontal. So we have kind of here an example of the short run and long run mixed together because we have the supply curves that are not horizontal and we have the long run supply curve, which is horizontal here. So then the final takeaway from this question is that we need to remember that average revenue is equal to marginal revenue because average revenue is constant for a firm. And so this is true in the long run and the short run for the firm. So marginal revenue and average revenue are equal because average revenue is always constant for a firm. Um, and that's gonna be true in the long run or the short run. Okay. And then the next question was asking, so what is the impact that taxes have on marginal revenue? So taxes impact marginal revenue by decreasing the overall revenue that the company can earn and also decreasing the quantity the company will sell. And so we can think about that just by looking at the marginal revenue formula. So we have the taxes are going to cause a decrease in the revenue and taxes are also going to cause a decrease in the quantity sold by the firm and the quantity produced by the firm. Okay, and I apologize. I think I just went a little bit over, um, but if anyone has any questions, please feel free to stick around. Um, and otherwise I will, um, 
I will talk to you all um, during the next review session. Cheers. Yes, so the um, midterm grades are gonna get posted probably um, either Wednesday or Thursday. The only thing I'm waiting for is just the uh, department to finally review all of them and give us kind of what they think the mid, uh, the curve should be. Um, so I should have everything ready to go uh, by Wednesday or Thursday. Um, so you'll probably be able to see your grades in uh, your uncurved grades in uh, Blackboard um, today. and get started. Okay. Oh, darn. So the first question that we, or that I had today um, was asking about sunk costs and the impact that sunk costs have. So I think the first important thing to clarify is that sunk costs are not just land. Um, sunk costs can be anything that has already been paid for. So it's not just land or kind of like the physical, kind of big like physical um, infrastructure pieces that people tend to think of. Um, the sunk cost can be anything. It can be anything that you have already paid for or you've committed to paying for in that you cannot recover the money you use to pay for it. And so what does that mean? So it basically means some costs can be something like a worker contract, uh, building leases, material purchased for a project, um, anything like that. So basically sunk costs are just things that you can't get your money back. And you could almost imagine it like kind of a return. So like imagine you purchase something on clearance and it's all sales are final. So once you buy it, that thing is a sunk cost. You can't get your money back for it. It's just done. So that's what a sunk cost is. Just something you cannot get money back for. You've already paid for it and you don't need to think about it when you're making your future decision. So just kind of as an example to follow that fully through, um, let's say that we bought something on clearance and it turns out that it didn't fit correctly. So when buying, when buying the thing, the next thing, you should not consider the purchase you made on clearance because that's a totally irrelevant cost and you cannot recoup that at all. It's just money you've thrown away basically. And so because it's money you've thrown away, you should not consider it when making your next decision. Okay. <clears throat> so the next question was asking about profit maximization. So I think the first thing to say with profit maximization is that we should always remember for profit maximization, price is equal to marginal cost. That's kind of our profit maximization maxim. And we can even go further 
And remember, this is only for perfectly competitive firms. So for perfectly competitive firms, price is also the same as average revenue and marginal revenue. So average revenue equals marginal revenue, which equals price, which equals marginal cost. That is how firms maximize their profits. So I think a good way to think about that is actually taking a look at this graph and kind of understanding what the different points mean. So we know from uh, what we just talked about that Q1 is the profit maximizing quantity. That's where the marginal cost is equal to the marginal revenue and the price. So this is where we wanna be. We wanna be here. But what does it mean if we're at the two other points? So at QA or at QB. So if we're at QA, what that means is basically we could increase our production of a good because every unit we produce from this point to this point, we're earning profits on because the marginal cost of producing the next good is lower than the marginal revenue we're receiving for the good. So this is profit. This is profit. That's profit. So all of those little points, those are profit that we're not earning because we're producing at a quantity that is lower than the profit maximizing quantity. So then let's talk about QB. So for QB, the marginal cost is greater than the marginal revenue. So what does that mean? Well, that means that for every unit of the good we're producing greater than Q1, we're actually losing money. So this is lost revenue because the cost is greater than the revenue. So if we produce this good right here, we're actually losing this amount of money on the good. The same is true for this as well as for that. So all of those are basically each additional good we're producing, we're losing money on those goods. So we need to go back to Q1, which is our profit maximizing quantity. So remember, when you are at a point where marginal cost is greater than marginal revenue, you need to reduce the quantity produced. If, on the other hand, you're at a point here where marginal revenue is greater than marginal cost, you should increase production because you could increase your profits. Okay, and I have just kind of a little simple paragraph here that just kind of further talks about that. So think about the marginal cost of producing an additional flower. So the marginal cost of producing additional flowers is greater than the benefit to society as measured by what people are willing to pay. Okay, so I'm gonna unpack that a little bit because that's kind of a lot. Um, so the marginal cost of making one additional flower is greater than the benefit to society, which is basically the willingness to pay. So then what that means is since costs are greater than the benefits, it would make sense to produce a lower quantity of the good because the costs are greater than the benefit of producing the good. So that's kind of another little explanation for um, the difference at this point. So that was really talking about this point right here when the marginal cost is greater than the marginal revenue. Okay, so once again, I had another question that was a little bit different than the prior question, but still kind of similar in the way that it was thinking about the question. So this question was specifically asking about profit maximization. Um, and it was asking about profit maximization and just kind of how do you find it and how do you think about it? 
So profit maximization, and we can specifically think about it for this graph, is always going to be the point where the price is equal to the average revenue, marginal revenue. And so remember, the point that we produce at is where price is equal to marginal cost or where the average revenue, marginal revenue price intersects the marginal cost curve, which in this case is at this point. So then this is our quantity. And because the average cost is actually lower than the price in this case, this is going to be our profits. So we are earning profits, which means that in the long run, firms or additional firms are going to enter the market and compete away our profits. But in the short run, we can earn these profits because profits are just the difference between the marginal revenue, price, average revenue, and marginal cost. <clears throat> okay, so then the next question was asking about um, marginal revenue and marginal revenue's impact on, um, or marginal revenue and why do we use it? So the first thing to remember is that marginal revenue is not only used by firms in competitive markets, um, and this is really important. So it's not only used by the firms in competitive markets, it's also used by monopolists, oligopolists, in monopolistically competitive firms. And those are all things we'll learn about in future chapters. So um, we'll see that the monopolistic firm, marginal revenue is very, very important. But the biggest thing that I wanted to kind of have uh, people take away was that marginal revenue is effectively just the total revenue over the quantity. And this is why it's something that's not just for perfectly competitive firms, because this total revenue over total quantity, that's gonna be true regardless of the market that we're in. That's gonna be true uh, of various firms in various markets, because all firms have total revenue and all firms produce quantity. So we can always use this calculation here. Okay. And so now I just wanted to touch on a couple more points. And let me see if I can find, ah, okay. So the other piece that we had that I wanted to mention was kind of reiterate the marginal revenue equals marginal cost piece, but reiterate that when we're thinking about um, what it means to be at QA versus QB and how that impacts the profit. So we kind of already talked about this, but just really quickly, when we're thinking about the profit maximizing quantity of a firm, Remember, the point you choose is always MR equals MC. And we can see that at this point. And so there was, there was a question that was kind of asking, uh, how do we know that firms are earning profits if they produce at this point where the marginal revenue intersects the marginal cost? So it's a really good question. So you don't inherently know that. The only thing you know is that if a firm is producing where marginal revenue and marginal cost are equal, that is where that individual firm, that's the largest amount of profit that the firm can make. But the firm doesn't have to be making a profit. That is just that firm's profit maximizing quantity, but that doesn't say anything about the marginal revenue curve in the market. And so what that means is we could have a situation that is actually the opposite of this. And so if we're thinking about what that could look like, it's basically just gonna be the inverse of this. 
So you're gonna have this quantity in this price and you will have the price in the market, so P star. And because of this, let's say that this is your marginal cost curve and this is your average cost curve. Okay. So note here that this is the profit maximizing quantity for this individual firm. So this is where the marginal revenue intersects with the marginal cost curve. But the average cost curve in this case is actually above the intersection point. So basically what that means is that this is actually losses. So this firm is actually losing money, even though it's producing at its profit maximizing quantity. And the reason for that is because this firm's profit maximizing quantity is not high enough in this market for it to be a, for it to be competitive. And so because of that, this firm in the market is most likely going to exit the market because they cannot earn profits. And so what does it mean when a firm uh, has to think about exiting or entering the market? And so I specifically wanted to kind of touch on the short run here because there was another question asking about the implications of the short run and how firms decide when they should enter or exit a market. Okay, so let's say the market price in this case is going to be $5. And we have our marginal cost curve. And this is going to be marginal revenue, okay. So now we're going to have our traditional average cost curve. But now I'm going to throw in one additional curve. So this is the, and actually let me do that in a different color so it's a little more visible. So this is our average variable cost curve. Let me draw it so it's a little bit more extreme. Okay. So the point that we know the firm is going to produce at is going to be the intersection of the marginal cost in the marginal revenue. Okay, so the firm is making losses and the firm is making losses of this. So these are the losses that the firm is making. Now the question is, should the firm shut down in the short run? So should the firm shut down in the short run? And in this case, the answer is actually no. And so the reason for that is because you'll see this average variable cost curve, and you'll note that it is below the profit maximizing quantity. So because this firm 
is covering its average variable costs by this difference, the firm should stay in production in the short run because it can cover its average variable costs. It cannot cover its uh, total costs, but it can cover its average variable costs, which is the only thing that we care about in the short run. In the short run, the decision to stay in business is completely determined by if the price is greater than average variable cost. If the price is greater than average variable cost, stay in business. Even if you don't cover your average total costs or your average costs. Okay, so that is all of the questions that I had. I did just want to briefly say, um, let me 